Hello, welcome to Roots Tech. It's nice to see your smiley faces. Good morning, Salt Lake City. Welcome to our online viewers. It's great to be here. My name is Ellen Schindelman Coet. I um, live in Colorado and I'm really honored and pleased to be here. So this session is getting started in Jewish genealogy. And my slides are flipping around a little bit, but we are going to ask you to please silence all your electronic devices. There is no audio or video recording in this session and please no taking photos of the slides. So let's get started by defining that Jewish genealogy is a methodology. That's what we're really here to talk about today. And getting started in Jewish genealogy is really no different than it is for any other faith, uh, particularly here in America, or an ethnic group for that matter. Let's um, consider that Jewish methodology includes unique cultural and traditional clues that are often found in names languages and religious practice. And we'll talk and touch a little bit upon certain websites and resources that are very specific to Jewish genealogy. Um, this is flipping around a little just to let my tech people know. Uh, always start with yourself. This is true for any beginning research project in family history. We want you to start with yourself and work backwards to build a tree. Some tips always include to interview your eldest relatives because they may not be around forever, but the records should be. And you want to exhaustively search those civil records before utilizing the foundational Jewish genealogy resources that I'll introduce today. And some of those include what's unique about Jewish gravestones, there are specialized online databases, Jewish institutional records, and Jewish newspapers. So set your goals. Perhaps that means learning original surnames or given name variations. We're gonna talk a lot about names today because names are a real challenge in Jewish genealogy. Uh, we're gonna talk about where an immigrant came from and linking into family or community networks to learn more. There seems to be a ghost here pushing my slides forward, and you see my hands, I'm not touching it. <laughs> uh, you can't tell me. That's where I am, thank you. Okay, so that's our getting started overview. So we're gonna move forward. Let's talk about research plans. I think it did it again. I'm a big fan of research plans. There are very sophisticated versions online. I put a couple of links in the handout um, that you can take a look at afterwards. But your research plan can be basic and it can still provide a roadmap outlining the who, what, where, when, and why of your project. It helps you to stay focused, organized, and be as efficient as you possibly be with your project. Because we all know what a rabbit hole it is when we start surfing the internet in the middle of the night and you can end up in a million places researching something you really don't care about. The main part of your research plan might be to establish a genealogy research question or a goal. One question at a time is best, but a few that um, are related can work. So an example for a question or a goal of your research plan might be, who is my grandfather? It's as simple as that. Where did my family come from? Why did they leave? How many siblings did our immigrant ancestor have? These are all basic starting points for any family history project. Another important part is a starting place for your research plan. What do you know already as you begin this journey? And where have you found that information? Is it Aunt Faga's handwritten tree? Is it an online compiled tree? Is it interviews uh, with a variety of relatives? Have you started researching on a commercial website already? 
kind of make a list, take an accounting of what you've done already. Where are you starting this project? I was talking beforehand with a few people when I first came in this morning, and one example was I took a DNA test and I now have 6% Jewish ancestry. What do I do with that? So at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna go through three case studies real quickly, and for each type of starting point where you're coming from to get started in Jewish genealogy, we'll begin and I'll give you some really good starting places to begin your search. Are we good? Wait a minute. Okay, so names. I put together this nice little wordle, this uh, word cloud, with a lot of different terminology and phrasing for how we describe Jewish names. There are linguists, there are people who study onomastics, there are people who write these massive size reference books about Jewish names. And when I say Jewish names, I'm talking given names, first names. I'm also talking Jewish names, which are names used in prayer by Jews. And I'm talking surnames. All three categories can be quite complicated, and the reasons vary. Jews were, were migratory, so they often lived in a lot of countries with a lot of different languages. Sometimes it's because when the sound of a language came into the United States and different people were recording their names, even the, sp the person themselves, they didn't know English well enough to spell the name consistently. So there are all kinds of transcriptions and indexes on online databases, um, some written by Jewish people themselves, others written by government officials, where the names are spelled differently, they're pronounced differently, they're all over the place. So a really major rule in Jewish genealogy is to not get stuck on spelling. I know there are one study, name, name studies out there. Uh, in the British Isles, in English, we find this quite often. Jewish genealogy is not the place to be doing that. Don't get stuck on spelling. Most Jews were immigrants coming from different uh, languages and backgrounds. Um, did it again. <laughs> and uh, this really affects how you look for the names. So I'm starting out with this topic and I'm gonna provide a few tools for you because then when we talk about even civil records, the civil records might be difficult to navigate to find the right record and then match different records together to prove it's the same person. So this is an advanced topic, but it's a required topic when you're just getting started in Jewish genealogy. I apologize for the ghost in the room who's playing havoc on our slides this morning. This is the first session of Roots Tech, so I appreciate your patience as we work through this. I came for a tech check yesterday too, so we should be fully ready to go this morning. The slide that I had up with the Wordle and all the different words around Jewish names, um, I looked up a lot of those in some of these reference books, and there are all kinds of professional official phrases for, you know, we would say someone's nickname for Michael is Mike. Well, there are words for what a nickname. There are uh, diminutives, that would be a nickname. So uh, Russian Empire Jewish name might be Dimitri, but the nickname or diminutive would be Dima. And another version of Dima might be Dimala, which means little Dima. So think in American terms like Michael, Mike, and Mickey. So there can be those kinds of uh, Americanized sort of versions and nicknames. Um, but there are also uh, versions in other languages, and in particular, we're gonna talk about Hebrew and Jewish. Okay, I think we're ready. <laughs> I think we're ready to rock and roll. So we're going to spend some time discussing the Jewish given names. I'm just gonna hold my finger here. Because there are many variations and there are tools for linking them together. So with the Jewish surnames, in addition to the given names, we also need to deal with languages. Polish is a good example. Polish has gender frequency. So if they're referring to a woman or a man, this can change in Polish the ending to a, Jew, to a, a Polish surname. 
And this is true of any faith. It's not just unique for Jewish records. It just so happens that a lot of Jews come from what was Poland or is Poland today. So keep an open mind. Let's go through some tools for names. Remember that the same immigrant can have many names. We have the secular names. Uh, German Hans can become Henry in America. There are different spellings for a name like Betty. The ending can be an E, an I-E, a Y, um, an I-E-Y. Keep in mind, spelling doesn't matter, especially with the Jewish families. I already mentioned the diminutives. There's something called patronymics. Patronymics are used in countries of the former Russian Empire, the former uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, that part of Eastern and Central Europe. And a patronymic is a name attached to a given and surname. So you'll be called, let's say, Henry, son of David, and then your surname, say Cohen. So the patronymic is the son of your father's name. It is similar but different from the fact that in Jewish religious names, the father's name is appended to a given name as well. This is great because in a patronymic, it's based on the secular name. You're the son of, let's say, Henry. But in the Jewish name, it's based on the Jewish name. So you could be son of Chaim. So we'll show you some examples. I'll show you the Jewish example on a gravestone in just a minute. And we talked about not getting hung up on spelling. These are a sampling of the books available. There is a publishing company that is still in existence, although the ownership recently changed, called Avotenu Publishing. And they are sort of the experts on Jewish name books. You can find these books in reference libraries. Family Search has copies of them over at the main library. Um, you can get them on interlibrary loan. You can purchase them from Avotenu Publishing online. You can also find them in the resale market. They are expensive because these reference books tend to run like 500 to 1,000 pages. But there are given name books and there are surname books. So as you can see, there's the um, dictionary of Jewish surnames from Galicia, a dictionary of Sephardic surnames, a dictionary of Jewish names in the Russian Empire, a dictionary of German Jewish names, and then on the other side, the left side, there are Jewish personal names, uh, dictionaries and handbooks of Ashkenazi given names and their diminutives or variations, and Russian Jewish names. And this is just a sampling, there are even more. So even the pros like myself, when we come across a new sounding name to us in a foreign language or just is spelled differently, we go to these reference books and we look up the names to see what they represent. So let me demonstrate how this works. You all know the name Hannah. We have Hannahs in the United States. Some people spell it Hana, H-A-N-A. -A. In the synagogue, you might hear it pronounced as Hana. That's more of a Hebrew pronunciation. When I looked up Hana, Hana, and Hana, none of those spellings appear in the dictionary of Ashkenazi surnames. What did appear was this name Hana, K-H-A-N-E. Sounds like Hana, but it's a little different because the alphabet in Poland and in the Russian languages would be different. All of these names that are listed below on these two pages are derivations of the name Hannah, as we would say it in America. So if you're looking for your Jewish great-grandmother, Hannah Cohen, likely in her immigration records, her Jewish name used in religious services, or in records in another country when you jump the pond to look for her, are not going to say Hannah the way you hear it and spell it in American English. So this is where it's important. I was looking and doing some research on a Hannah, known as Hannah in America, and I went to JRI Poland, which is a website, uh, Jewish Records Indexing Poland, where there are indexes to Jewish records and links to Polish state archive records, and I found Hinka, K-H-I-N-K-A. I had never heard this name. I looked Hinka up, and it's a version of Hannah. So I kind of knew, based on it being in the same region, I had been researching the family and some of the relationships to other people in the record. This Hinka in a Polish document was the same person as my American Hannah. So this is sort of how we apply it and use these books to sort of have variations and determine if names you're finding on a record aren't quite matching what you expect in American English. Okay. 
This is the Jewish Given Names database. There is a website called JewishGen. It is the largest um, holder um, of Jewish records online. Uh, we argue about whether there are over 30 million records or more than that because different websites, you might hear their numbers, like Ancestry has this number of records, MyHeritage has this number. They all count it differently. That's sort of the insider secret. So Jewish Gen counts conservatively and says we have 30 million, but probably they have 50 or 60 million because in a record, more than one person can be named. And if you're only naming the primary name, you count it once. You count all the names in the record, there are more names than that. So Jewish Gen has a lot of records with a lot of names, let's say more than 30 million. And I'll talk more about best websites in Jewish genealogy at my presentation on Saturday at three o'clock if you wanna get into what are the best websites for researching Jewish genealogy. But as an introduction to Jewish Gen, since we're talking about names, let's look at this Jewish Given Names database. So, the search input allows you to use either of the two different search features. They're titled European and Foreign. That doesn't really do anything for me. This page on Jewish Gen is hard to find. As you can see, the version on the left side here of the screen is in red and blue font. It's very hard on the eyes to read. And I think the search function buried at the bottom of the page is not very helpful. Good news is that in 2008, Jewish Gen shared a bunch of their records and tools with Ancestry. And when Ancestry got a version of the Jewish Given Names database, they put it into a more familiar interface like they use for their other search pages. So on the right side here, we see what Ancestry did with the same database. It's actually free to search Jewish record collections on Ancestry. That may not be well known, but it is. You don't have to have a paid subscription. So if you wanted to go to the Jewish uh, landing page, there is a landing page on Ancestry, you can find a box with this Jewish Given Names Variation Database, and you can plug in different names you're finding in documents without having to access those reference books. So this is kind of what it looks like. Again, try Jewish Gen or try Ancestry, but this is a way if you don't have access quickly to one of the reference books, you can go in here, plug in the name Chinka or Hendel, and it should tell you that that name is Hannah, that that's another version, and you'll know that it's the same name that you're looking at across languages. So let's talk about the American Soundex. If any of you have done genealogy for a while, You've probably heard that the National Archives, NARA, has an American Soundex. It's actually, people don't refer to it, but it's called the Russell Soundex. And it's an alphanumeric code that's assigned to surnames, we're talking surnames, but it's really best for English or Americanized names. So you assign um, a letter, my last name is Coet, so K is my first um, alphabetical letter that's assigned to my Soundex code. And then you see this chart, you then go through and you assign the consonants other numbers. And then you search for your name using the Soundex to pick up a variety of spellings that might not be spelled the same way as your name. So the NARA Soundex in American records is fantastic. But when you have more uh, Eastern European, Jewish, or uh, Slavic names, there are a lot of name types that don't fit into the NARA Soundex very well. So my name, for example, Coet, would only come out as a K300. It's only picking up the letters K and T. So that really, to me, sounds like Kit something, not Coet, because no W is assigned a number. Vowels are not assigned a number. And this could pick up almost any K sounding name that also has a T in it. It's not very helpful for narrowing down what my surname might mistakenly be transcribed as or something like that. So in response to this, the Jewish genealogy community created Jewish soundexes, and there are two that are primary. One is called the Deitch Mokotov system, the other is called the Bader Morse system. In fact, one of the creators of Bader Morse is Steve Morse, and I saw him this morning. He is speaking at this conference. He was one of the creators of this. And it's basically a mathematical algorithm that assigns numbers and letters to Jewish sounding names so that more similar Jewish sounding names will show up in a search when you're in a database, for example. 
So on the screen, you see there's the unified search page on JewishGen, which is a great starting point if you go to JewishGen. JewishGen has so much information, it can be a little overwhelming where to begin. The unified search is a great place because it searches across almost 100% of the databases found on JewishGen. And it will give you an idea where in the world, based on where indexed records are on JewishGen, are found. So when you use the unified search function on JewishGen, there are four fields you can search, any combination of given name, surname, town name, and an any or miscellaneous field. But the important thing is this highlighted column, the second column in the unified search. It's a drop-down menu. And you're given the choice to search phonetically like, sounds like, starts with, is exactly, fuzzy, fuzzier, and fuzziest matching. I do not recommend the fuzzy matching of any kind. It's not useful. But I do recommend that you search under both phonetically like, which is the default, and is the Deitch Mokotov system, and the second choice, sounds like, which will apply the Bader Morse soundex. And I gave you some examples of how that can even differ on Jewish names. So taking my unusual name, Coet, and let me just take a step back and tell you, Coet's not a real name. The name was Itzkowitz, which was a Russian patronymic meaning son of, of Itzik. And my husband's grandfather came back from World War II. He was tired of people mispronouncing and spelling the name or thinking he was Polish. So he chopped off the I-T-Z at the beginning and he chopped off the Z at the end and boom, added a T, we became Coets. So if you know people named Coet, I am not related to them, unless they also changed their name from Itzkowitz. Um, but anyway, the examples on Deitch Makatov for Coet, you can see came out Cabot, Cabot with two T's and one T, Cubit, Cabot, Cobit, Cabet, Chabot, Cuvet, and Coet, Covet. Bader Morris had totally different names it picked up. Things like Haft, Copita, Cabot, Coput, Caputa, Caputa with a C, Kuwait, Chebath, and more. So as you see, many of these names are not anything similar to Coet, so it's not a mistake if someone's spelling it Chebath. That's clearly not the same name as Coet. But I know for a fact, Kovit and Kovit in Hebrew can be spelled with different Hebrew um, um, letters in the alphabet. And even my father-in-law, who's fluent in Hebrew, tells me that my ketubah is spelled, we spelled our name wrong. And he explained to me how it was spelled differently in Hebrew. Um, this is the kind of thing you're going to encounter as you start to look at these transliterations and these examples of spellings. So on Jewish Gen, Deitch Mokotov and Bader Morse are applied to the unified search, and it's a very helpful tool. The only other place we find Deitch Mokotov is on the Jewish landing page search for Ancestry. Now, you've probably been to Ancestry.com, they have all kinds of search options off of the drop-down menu on the home page. When you go to a general search or within a general collection search, Deitch Mokotov is not applied. The only place on Ancestry it's applied is within the Jewish landing page, which is a link page to all things Jewish on Ancestry. Um, and within it, they use Deitch Mokotov. So just keep that in mind as you're searching names and spellings for your surnames, there are some uh, tools of Jewish Gen and Ancestry, at least, that will give you the algorithms to search for Jewish names. But let's not forget my heritage. My heritage developed something called global name translation. And this may uh, help anyone searching foreign languages because it's a tool that enables you to search in one language. Let's say because we're all speaking English, you put in something in English and the results from every other document they have in any other language will come back as results. This is important, especially for a company like MyHeritage that has collections in Hebrew. MyHeritage is based in Israel. They have Russian language documents. I just found one for a great uncle in the last couple of weeks in Russian, but I searched for my maiden name, Schindelman, and he popped up in a Russian document. So this works within family trees and within their record search. So 
don't overlook my heritage in terms of looking for Jewish or foreign names. They have a particularly powerful tool, the global name translation technology, to find your names. All right, so we talked about all of these ways to define Jewish names and spellings, and when you're finding things that don't quite match your Americanized Hannah, these are ways you can determine if you're looking at the right records. Let's talk about the records. In our research plan, one of our first things was to exhaustively search civil records. So Jewish genealogy methodology is no different than any other faith or ethnic group in America or around the world that you start with yourself and you start with the country that the person you're researching is living in. I'm talking a lot about the US because I live here and we're here today. So American research records, you would be looking at things like the US federal census, which has been put out every 10 years since 1790, and the public part of those records is available from 1950 back. So 1790 to 1950 are available. Great tool for starting any family history project you're working on, regardless of, of ethnicity or faith, because it builds households together. It links people together and it gives you different information as well. I'm doing a lecture on that tomorrow morning if you wanna come with Sonny Morton on census stories at 8 a.m. So if you feel like getting up bright and early, come on to hear some good census stories tomorrow. The other documents that are American civil records that are helpful for this include passenger manifest, once you know who the immigrant generation was, naturalization or citizenship papers, and vital records, of course. All of these are your basic toolkit of records you should be looking at to start your tree and build it out, whether they're Jewish or not. So where do you find names on these types of documents? Well, in secular records, the great place to find names because in passenger records, it may list who they traveled with, who they came from, who they're going to. There are a lot of names. So passenger records are great for finding names, name variations of relatives, um, it may be that your immigrant Jew was a minor. So it's gonna be important who they travel with, who their father is, who their mother is, what the names of their siblings are. Names are just all over the place. You gotta know the names. Naturalizations, the vital records in the Russian Empire, we call them metrical records. Uh, census records in the Russian Empire, where many American Ashkenazi Jews originate from, are called revision lists. Same thing, it's a census. There are school lists, tax registers, and city directories. In terms of the Jewish resources you might look at for finding names and name variations are gravestones. There is something called synagogue memorial plaques or site plaques. These are usually found in synagogue congregations. When you walk around the sanctuary, you'll see there are metal boards in a lot of congregations filled with names that are inscribed. Some have little light bulbs that are lit on the anniversary of the death, which is called the Yort site date. And you can find genealogical information. One, because Jewish names have those two generations included, every religious Jewish name will include the father of the person's name in it. So if you don't know those two generations, you can find the father's name on a yard site plaque. Um, sometimes they even say where someone was from or you know, Sam the Butcher it's for an occupation or some other random information. But yard site pla plaques at a minimum are great for the two generation Jewish name, but they can provide other information. And Jewish Gen has an indexing project so some of these memorial plaques at synagogues around the world are also indexed on Jewish Gen. So if you get a link to one of those, you might want to take, take a look at the original photo. In addition, we have ketubah. Ketubah is the marriage contract. It's a Jewish marriage contract. I will show you an example of that. There's something called a wimple. What's a wimple? There are moyal records, which are circumcision records. So in Judaism, the tradition is to circumcise boys at eight days of age. And the person that usually conducts that process and that ceremony is called a moil. So we'll find indexed records under moil register, circumcision re register, sometimes a rabbinic register. Um, nowadays, we see a lot of doctors or surgeons conduct circumcision. But in the olden days, they may not have had all of those roles in a small town or shtetl. So the butcher might have been the moil. So we find the records and the types of people who conducted this ceremony all over the place. I'm gonna show you a Colorado example. 
There are also Yisker books. Yisker books are memorial books. A lot of people think that they're solely about commemorating the Holocaust. I had a friend who was an academic who did her dissertation on Yisker books, and she said that as a, a form of Jewish literary tradition, Yisker books predate the Holocaust, and there were actually a lot of memorial books by occupation that were created in Eastern Europe. So most of what we find and we refer to are these memorial books that tell the history of a Jewish community, perhaps destroyed in the Holocaust. They name lots of people. There are essays about their ancestors, there are maps where the Jews lived in a town. Uh, there can be uh, discussions about how occupations were found. In one, one town, that there was this whole chapter on this porcelain factory. And apparently a Jewish guy owned a porcelain factory. And when I went to Ukraine, I was in a little local ethnography museum, and I picked up a piece of porcelain and I turned it over and it was the name of that factory that I had read about in the Yisker book, which was so cool. And then I even knew someone related to the family. So very, very cool. So lots of colorful background in Yisker memorial books. They're usually in Hebrew or Yiddish. I'll show you an example. And there's a project and an opportunity on Jewish gen to access those more easily. Other Jewish resources for names um, include institutional records. So by institution, think Jewish orphanage, Jewish hospital, uh, Jewish benevolent society. These kind of groups really grew as the Jewish population in the United States grew, and we don't really find them before 1890. But after 1880, 1890, when a large majority of Jews came to America, we begin to see these institutions forming. And when institutions form, what do they do? They create records. So we have a variety of those. I put a couple examples here. HIAS stands for the Hebrew Immigrant Association Society. Aid Society, thank you. Um, the IRO, the Industrial Records Office. Um, the joint refers to the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. A lot of these were very immigrant focused, but solidly Jewish resources, so very helpful. And in a lot of these I've just mentioned, um, in the secular and Jewish records, the origins of these immigrants will be included. So people ask, how do you figure out where they came from if all the census record says is born in Russia? Well, keep in mind, Russia changing borders what was considered Russia might be Ukraine today. And in the middle era, they might have considered it the Soviet Union or what's derogatorily called Little Russia. So be aware that when you sometimes see where Jews are from, if they're coming from European empires that either don't exist, like the Prussian Empire, or a place like Bessarabia, which doesn't exist by that name anymore, sometimes you have to become an expert on geography of where these Jews were coming when they lived there, when they left, and what it's called today. So geography is a whole thing, and that's true for any faith or record or any group that you're looking for in those parts of the world. So I just wanted to mention a couple of other Jewish-specific resources to figure out origins. There's something called Lanzmannschaften. Uh, Lanzmann is a Yiddish term. It really just refers to these benevolent aid societies that were set up in major cities where there were large Jewish populations. So like. New York, Philadelphia, Montreal, um, other parts of the world. And um, these benevolent societies would create a cemetery and someone might be buried in their plot and they're based on where you came from. So when someone Jewish says, oh, my lawnsman, they're referring to someone who came from the same town or general region where they came from. It's someone from the old country that comes from the same area, my lawnsman. A Lonsman Shoften is a benevolent society around a certain town or origin place. So Lonsman Shoften records and the burial plots associated with them, great clues for origin. Uh, the tube I mentioned is the marriage contract. I'm gonna show you a wimple. What's a wimple? The Yisker books are also good for origin. Here's one you might not think of. Vintage photo postcards. If you're in a Jewish family from about 75 to 100 years ago, holiday cards were sent, usually in Yiddish, and they'd have a, a kind of a hokey photo on the front, not of your family, but of something about the holiday. And it would be sent at Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, or maybe at Passover, and it would say Happy Pesach. Well, these were sent to family and relatives, but they can have a lot of clues, because if you flip the postcard over, what do we find on postcards? We find 
the postmarks, right? So you would know where it's coming from. Sometimes the images on those postcards will have a place. There um, are collectors of Jewish shtetl postcards and they resell these on eBay all the time. So like I'm interested in a little place called Kirahaza, it was Hungary, today it's called Korolevo, Ukraine, because those borders changed. But there are always people selling the rail station in Kirahaza postcards. Well, that's a very small place. And I can only imagine that you either left from the train station there and you lived in that town or you came from around that area. So the identity of what the picture is and where it comes from or the photographer's studio on these cards can at least give you a little hint as to where something came from. There are Jewish newspapers, the most famous of which is called The Forward. You might have heard of The Forward. The Forward used to be printed only in Yiddish, then it went to Yiddish and English. It's still in publication today. There's an online version. And there were all kinds of columns in there that were sort of famous. Something called Bintel Briefs, another called the Gallery of Missing Husbands, where people would essentially talk about people who were missing, and they would say how tall they were, what they did for a living, where they were born, what their birth date was, all of this identifying genealogical information. On Jewish Gen, we've actually started indexing the Gallery of Missing Husbands, and there are even photos in there of my missing husband. So you can find a lot of genealogical information in these very unique Jewish newspaper columns. And then of course, just like we have community histories in America by county or by town, we also have Jewish community or synagogue histories to consult. So lots of places. So let's look at a couple of these juicy nuggets. One would be the Jewish gravestone. Now in America, a lot of times it's a lot less Hebrew a lot more English or only English. So when I tell you there are hidden gems, I'm referring to Jewish gravestones that have Hebrew letters. And Hebrew letters on a gravestone are not always Hebrew names. Sometimes they're Yiddish names. So you will need some help if you don't read Hebrew letters to sort of sound out what the name is. There are a lot of primers online that you can, if you're the linguist type that want to learn the language and apply sort of the code to figure out what sounds each letter have. It's like learning any foreign language. You can do it if you try. But look at all the gems in this one example. This happens to be an example out of the Okapawa Cemetery in Warsaw. My husband's family lived in Warsaw. Part of mine did too. So I was very interested when I visited Warsaw a few years ago. And I got this almost entirely Hebrew stone. So what do you do? So there are ways, line by line, to kind of figure out and crack the code. There's always an acronym at the top with two letters. Uh, we, I'm not going to get into all the letters because it's kind of difficult, but it essentially stands for Here Lies Buried. So these two letters at the top of every grave pretty much will start the cemetery stone inscription. Then there's usually some phraseology about the person's worthiness. Were they a good person? Were they humble? Were they modest? Were they religious? Uh, were they a, a rabbi? Were they a good, a good parent? So this one happens to say a modest woman. And then we get to the name. And it says Mrs. Hannah Giddle. Hannah Giddle is a two -na given name name. So that's another thing you'll find in terms of names with Jews. They're not always just Ellen, they're Ellen Irene. And sometimes the records will say Ellen, sometimes they'll say Irene, sometimes they'll say Ellen Irene. So here's a Hannah Giddle. She was known as Hannah or Hannah. And there's that two generation name. So it says Bat, daughter of. On a man's it would say Ben for son of or Bar, which is Aramaic. And then it will tell you her father's name. So right here, you know that Hannah Giddle's father was Yosef. We don't know what her maiden name was as a surname, but this stone happens to tell you her husband's name. That's not common. This one happens to say, wife of Chaim, Hakohen. Now you may think Hakohen is another surname. It's not. So there are, uh, there's a priestly sort of uh, caste in Judaism. It has to do with prayer. And he was of this priestly cl class. And that's considered an honor in Judaism. And there are certain prayers and things that are applied to Kohanes in the Jewish religion. They're acknowledging that on his gravestone. So it says she's the wife of Chaim, who is a Kohen. And then it has their surname, Zexer. It then tells you the Jewish calendar date 
that he, she died, 14 Tevit, 5677. And there are calendar conversion tools, like on Steve Morse's website, where you can put that Jewish date in and it will tell you the secular date. And the secular date might be a Julian calendar date or a Gregorian calendar date, depending on the year. So before um, the Russian Revolution, it was essentially the Julian calendar, and now we use the modern Gregorian calendar. Then there's a phrase, in a an acronym in Hebrew letters that is on almost every Jewish gravestone, and it stands for a portion of the book of Samuel, may his or her soul be bound up in the bound of life. It's on almost everything, every cemetery stone. And then interestingly, if you can see the green mossy area at the bottom, remember I told you this was in Warsaw, Poland? Well, if you can really see that, it actually says in Latin letters, Hanna Zexer. So that would have helped you if you were looking in Americanized um, English for a similar name, but a lot of times that won't even be there. So we know it's in Okapawa Cemetery. It's a very large city cemetery in the middle of Warsaw. Uh, it predates the Holocaust, and that would be a great place now that you have the dates and the names. You know the husband's name, you know her father's name. You could go look for a civil record based on this date. So lots of hidden gems of information. I can't emphasize enough, if you're starting, getting started on Jewish research, find where your Jewish relatives and ancestors are buried, get a photo of their gravestone, determine if it's in English or Hebrew, and get a translation. And where can you get a translation? Well, you can come to a conference like this and visit the International Association of Jewish Genealogical Society booth. Um, where I'll be sitting this, um, during lunch today if you wanted to bring a picture of a gravestone and others can help you. If not, there are online resources where you can upload a photo and get a basic translation. If you're on Facebook, there's Tracing the Tribe, there's the Jewish Genealogy Portal, there's even a Genealogy Translations Facebook group for all types of translation um, that you can just put it on Facebook and your million friends on Facebook can give you a translation. Jewish Den also has something called ViewMate, where you can upload a picture or a postcard or a small letter. Not, we're not talking dissertation length, but something manageable to translate. And there are volunteers on Jewish Gen that speak all kinds of languages. Maybe you want something from Ladino or Spanish or French or German. So lots of tools. Don't be intimidated if you have something like a gravestone that you need translated. There are plenty of people and resources and tools to help you to do that. Another example of a document, I mentioned the marriage contract before. This is a ketubah. It's my grandparents' ketubah. And you'll see it's a form, a form letter, essentially. A printer printed these out and either sold them or gave them away to rabbis and to synagogues throughout Manhattan and Brooklyn in a certain time period. And so many of my friends have the same exact looking ketubah where the officiant would just fill in the names, but they filled in the Jewish date. They put in the place of wedding. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because in this example, they wrote Brooklyn with Hebrew letters, um, but they'll include the groom's Jewish given name, which includes his father's name, the bride's given name, which includes the, the bride's father's given name. Uh, the terms of the contract are always the same. This is actually, it appears like Hebrew letters again, right? Well, this isn't Hebrew and this isn't Yiddish. This is actually in another language called Aramaic which predates modern Hebrew, which the Passover Seder Haggadah is written in. So there are a lot of Jewish languages, most of which you're going to come in contact with will be Hebrew or Yiddish. But the Ketubah contractual language has remained the same for hundreds or thousands of years, and it happens to be in Aramaic. And then there will be signatures. The rule is that there are two non-related witnesses. My own ketubah was signed by a relative. So sometimes there might even be a relative name as a clue on the bottom of a ketubah as well. Bottom line here, get those handwritten portions translated because you're going to pick up the Jewish name, a couple of generations, a place, and a date. Fantastic for genealogy. This is my ketubah. We had it hand painted. It used to be a thing in Jewish communities, particularly in Italy in the 1500s, to make these illuminated, beautiful pieces of art. So I wanted to do that. And we had our family tree uh, drawn around the contractual language. And then we had all of the names 
And obviously, as I told you before, my surname was spelled wrong, as my father-in-law told me on the day of my wedding. Um, it's spelled incorrectly. But there's an example of I have my own document that I spelled wrong, and it has a different spelling for co-it in Hebrew than what it should have been. But here's a little thing a lot of people don't know about ketubahs. Remember I said that the place in the printed one was handwritten in as Brooklyn for my grandparents? That's not actually the tradition. The tradition in the standard language is to identify the place of the wedding as being near to the confluence of two moving bodies of water. So in my ketubah, we said that I was married just north of the confluence of the Anacostia and Potomac rivers. Does anyone know where I was married? I was married in Arlington, Virginia, right across the river from Washington, DC. So of course you'd have to look for DC records or Virginia records in that case, but if you were to find an ancient ketubah that was Italian or German, um, they're often found in museums. The National Museum of Art in Israel has a ketubah collection. The Jewish Theological Seminary in Manhattan has a collection. There are others online. If you happen to link into an ancient ketubah, you want someone to translate this ketubah, not only for the names, but also for that unique identifier of where the wedding occurred. So keep that in mind. This is an example I told you I was gonna show you of a moil or circumcision registry. I happen to live in Colorado. This comes from the University of Denver Beck Archive, which houses the Rocky Mountain Jewish Historical Society. And usually I find circumcision or moil registers are in Hebrew letters, either Hebrew or Yiddish. Oddly, this one from the 1870s by Dr. John Elsner, who started Denver Health, if any of you are from Colorado, is in English. And he's an, a medical educated doctor, and yet there are typos and spelling errors in English throughout this document. So keep that in mind, the way we're very critical about editing and grammar and proper English, this was not always the case, even for the most highly educated people in America 100 or 200 years ago. Great examples here. The first one reads, and this is standard, a child eight days old, Ben Holstein, uh, the date, so this one's like May, of, May something, 1867, was named, and this would be given the Jewish religious name, Gershon Ben, or son of, Benjamin, Benjamin, in Denver, Colorado Territory. Colorado wasn't even a state at that point. Jumping down to the last one, this is not typical. The example reads, Young man, 27 years of age, Louis Anberg, the date, uh, named Arie, son of Levy in Black Hawk, which is a casino town outside of Denver. What's wrong there? The 27 years of age. This is not standard. In Judaism, usually boys are circum circumcised around eight days of life. So to be 27, to be uncircumcised, and to choose to be circumcised, which probably was a painful you know, rural procedure in Black Hawk, Colorado Territory that year. This is a choice which maybe was dictated by Amoyal hadn't come through this mountain town. Maybe he hadn't had an opportunity as a child depending on where he came from. And this was his opportunity to be circumcised. So when you find the, the amount of days or the age in a circumcision register, back it up. So if you subtract 27 from 1867, you know about when this person was born. Maybe not the same day and month because the 27-year-old is a little um, less typical, but the eight-day-old baby boy, you could back that up and look for a civil record. Now in Colorado, I happen to know there are not birth records that were mandated really consistently until 1920, but in other states we find vital records in America much earlier on the East Coast in the mid-1800s. So take a look, see what you can learn from a vital record if you can find it. What's a wimple? It's a piece of fabric, and it's usually long. It's about this high. They're handmade. It used to be more of a German language uh, community uh, tradition to create these pieces of fabric at the time, usually of a boy baby's birth. The boy would be wrapped in it, kind of like a swaddle. Um, they might be circumcised in it. The family would hold on to it, but would become somewhat of an heirloom. It could be used at the boy's bar mitzvah when he's coming of age at age 13 and reading the Torah for the first time. They might wrap the Torah, like as this picture shows, with the wimple. 
And then they might use it again at his wedding as the chuppah, the fabric covering over the couple during the wedding ceremony. And what's on a wimple? Well, they're handmade. It's just like if someone makes you a baby blanket or a quilt or some other piece of fabric that might have genealogical detail. This is the Jewish version of fabric that might have a Jewish name, the father's name, the place where the baby's born, the date of the birth, maybe even some other honorific things. So if you're finding pieces of fabric in a deceased family member's um, home collection and they happen to be Jewish, don't throw it away. Have some, take a picture at least and have somebody translate that for you for details. All right, I'm gonna zoom through Holocaust because I'm getting the sign back there. Um, I wanna give time for some questions and answers too. So there are unique Holocaust era resources. Just yesterday, someone here asked me, is it true that all Jewish records were destroyed in the Holocaust? That is a fable, that is a myth. And more and more are being digitized and going online. I would argue it is easier to find victims and survivors of the Holocaust now than it has ever been. And this comes into play with many, if not most, Jewish families, that sometimes we hit the Holocaust era wall and we think, oh, we can't get any farther. I want to give you hope and inspiration that you can. There are places to look. There are people to help you. These are some of the examples. There are whole lectures on any one of these repositories. Many of them are online. Um, but to give you an idea, Yad Vashem is a place I would begin. It's the Holocaust Museum that's in Israel, in Jerusalem. They have something called the Central Database of Shoah Victim Names that you can search. They have indexed records to the Holocaust. And then they'll show you a picture of the digitized image. It's a sophisticated archive with a lot of resources. I also showed you the drop-down menu here to give you an idea. They also have photos. They have survivor testimonies. They have deportation databases that show you if they left, let's say, Belgium, where it's likely they were deported to for a concentration or work camp. So lots of fascinating and helpful information if you're trying to recapture what happened to someone who was either a victim or a survivor of the Holocaust. Another, Jewish Gen has a Holocaust database. I don't know, there are hundreds of collections in there, um, but very specific, certain work camps, certain death camps. Uh, we have something called the Holocaust by bullets. We refer to the mass execution by bullets into mass graves that occurred in the former Soviet territories largely and in Poland. Um, there are resources through a French website called Yihad and Unum for that period and for those areas. The Arrelson Archives, this is the old International Red Cross, International Tracing Service based in Bad Arrelson, Germany. This is their website. Notice it's in English, not German. They don't have all of their collection online, but you can begin by searching to see for free what they have. They're also really good about you can send an inquiry to them if you're looking for someone, particularly survivors, because they kept all of their survivor inquiry letters after the war that said, hey, my name's Ellen. I'm looking for my brother, Mark. I live in Argentina. Um, do, you do you happen to know what happened to Mark? And well, they might get a letter from Mark and it says, hey, I'm looking for my sister Ellen, I live in Israel, and we don't know how to find each other, but the Red Cross could have connected us, and they kept those kind of letters too. So victims and survivors. USC Shoah Foundation, you might have heard of Steve, um, Steven Spielberg's uh, monumental project to collect video testimonies of Holocaust survivors about 20 years ago now, it's been a while. These are name indexed and can be found online through their website, but also through Ancestry and Jewish Gen. Yisker Memorial Books, I mentioned earlier, these are memorials to towns usually destroyed in the Holocaust. The original language books can be found digitized all over the internet at this point. The New York Public Library, uh, uh, WorldCat, um, Internet Archive has them. Um, the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts. There are a lot of ways to see them digitized in foreign languages. What Jewish Gen volunteers have done is take those foreign language materials and translate portions or whole books into English. And the books that are entirely translated, Jewish Gen is even selling um, to the public so you can have a version of a Yisker book fully translated into English. And there's a whole list of those on Jewish Gen. These are the reprints. There are also shtetl life books. A lot of people don't bring these up, but I do. I think academics who do dissertations and write journal articles and publish books are a great resource for any genealogist. 
So people always say to me, well, if I can't find a Yiskra book, or even if I don't know the town but only the region or country my family came from, why did they leave? What was life like? There are a lot of books on shtetl life out there. Here are three. My favorite is Life is with People. Sephardic, I'm not gonna get into this. It's a whole specialty area. Um, maybe in the question and answers, or certainly afterwards, you can come ask for some resources. But on Jewish Gen, there's now a Sephardic collection. It used to be most of Jewish Gen was Ashkenazi-based. Ashkenazi are the Jews from Eastern and Central Europe. Sephardic would be the Jews from Spain, Portugal, the Mediterranean Basin, maybe North Africa. Uh, Sephardic research is a little different. For example, Ashkenazi Jews name after, de after deceased ancestors or relatives. Sephardic Jews name after the living. So even their naming traditions and patterns can be a clue in your family if you're seeing multiple names that repeat when people are still alive, that's a clue in your family that they're Sephardic. So Jeff Malka is kind of the king of Sephardic research. He's a retired ophthalmologist from DC and he wrote the book on Sephardic research and he donated his collection of databases to Jewish Gen and these can be searched online. Rabbinic is a whole specialty area. Um, there's a Jewish Gen Rabbinic Special Interest Group. The Library of Congress uh, Hebraic Division has a lot of resources for rabbinical research. And the reference book that Abotenu also provides is called The Unbroken Chain. And this includes a lot of biographical sketches about rabbinic families, which can be researched a lot farther back than the typical Ashkenazi family. So if you link into a rabbinic dynasty, that's a really good indicator. You can find uh, more people and a bigger network of pedigree charts. DNA, real quick, running out of time, I know. Uh, there's Jewish testing, both Ashkenazi and Sephardic, on the four major sites, Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, Ancestry, and 23andMe. MyHeritage probably drills down the farthest with the most groups, but you can find Sephardic also at, at uh, MyHeritage and Family Tree DNA. And then some specialty categories tend to only be at Family Tree DNA and MyHeritage. And you can check their websites for what their ethnic groups currently are. They constantly change. There's plenty of education and networking. I put these in the hand, handouts. There's a Jewish Gen discussion group, those Facebook pages I mentioned, and other local Jewish genealogy societies that can help you with mentoring or beginner workshops. So I'm not gonna go through the case studies, but they basically would have covered, you know someone specific was Jewish in your family, or you don't know someone who was Jewish, but your DNA results are showing a Jewish origin, what do you do? Or you don't have a DNA result, and you don't know someone specific or rumored to be Jewish, but there's a legend that your family was Jewish, or a name sounds Jewish. So that last category, you really need to bring your tree to someone like me, and we'll take a look and see if there are any obvious clues. Um, but you can also run your names through those unified searches and get started on Jewish Gen, on MyHeritage with the global name translation, even on Ancestry with so many Jewish Holocaust era records. So with that, let's go to some questions real quickly. I did mention that I'm speaking a couple more times, so census tomorrow. What's Jewish about Jewish genealogy tomorrow afternoon? The best website, Saturday at three. And if you like the lecture, please be sure to give me some good feedback in the app. And let's take some questions real quickly, real quickly. So raise your hand so we can see who has them. And if I can't answer them, we can answer them afterwards offline. Yes? If I'm looking for Lithuanian or that area, So the question is, if I know that I have Lithuanian Jewish ancestry, where do I start? Uh, there is something called Litvak SIG, Special Interest Group, S-I-G. They have their own website. So if you Google Litvak, L-I-T-V-A-K, S-I-G, you'll come to the Litvak SIG website. They have a, a database. That is a great place to start. Their data is also on Jewish Gen. So I would say the unified search for Jewish Gen will capture other areas near Lithuania that may have once been considered Lithuania. So I would go to the unified search for Jewish Gen as well. Yeah. Other than 
So the question is, I mentioned the confluence of rivers on the Ketuba as a way to identify a town or origin place. Um, I don't know if other ethnicities use that or not. That's a good question for the people who do maps and gazetteers. Okay. Yes, quickly. Viewmate. Viewmate is the place on Jewish Gen to upload photos to then direct people to translate them for you. Viewmate. So can you also upload pictures of grapes and stones? Yes. Okay. Anything you want, any image. Mm -hmm. 